It united the states and established the three branches of our federal government. For 200 years, the Constitution of the United States has been our nation's fundamental law and a framework for liberty. The Constitution and its first 10 amendments, the Bill of Rights, are an enduring proclamation that a just government must abide by rules that enhance the rights of the individual. The place of the Bill of Rights and the Constitution in society is very much like the place of oil in an automobile engine. It's essential to keep the machine running. As the nation's ultimate interpreter of the Constitution, the U.S. Supreme Court defines the rules of government and ensures that all public officials obey them. The nine justices in this high court hand down opinions that often profoundly influence American society. The Supreme Court is primarily a court of appeals, choosing cases that come from lower federal courts or the state Supreme Courts. Individuals bring cases. Those cases help establish principles, and many Connecticut citizens have been at the forefront of that. In 1961, Estelle Griswold and Planned Parenthood challenged a state law prohibiting contraceptive use. The case leads to a new constitutional right. In 1839, enslaved West African Shunge leads a successful rebellion, focusing attention on slavery in the years before the Civil War. Affirmative action is attacked in 1990, forcing Richard Ramirez and his Hartford TV station to defend their broadcast license. Central Connecticut State College student activists in 1969 fight a ban by college president F. Don James prohibiting their meeting on campus. When businessman Louis Zemmel wants to visit Cuba in 1961, the State Department says no. Can government regulate travel abroad? In 1938, Russell Cantwell and his Jehovah Witness family defy a state law against soliciting, leading to a landmark religious freedom case. Terror grips the state as the mad dog killers run wild in the 1950s. But once they're caught, heavy-handed police work could set them free. All of these major cases in the Supreme Court are the ultimate result of individual people suing and being sued or being arrested and saying, essentially, I got a right here and I want that right vindicated. Connecticut citizens whose cases have been heard by the Supreme Court have come from all walks of life, from crusaders to criminals, from victims to visionaries. This is the story of seven of those cases. It started really in 1956. There was a series of, of murders occurred, which terrorized the state of Connecticut. Papers were filled with the mad dog killers. And they'd just walk in, pull out a gun, and say, this is a stick up. And always, before they went for the money, they would pistol whip or blackjack or just shoot the, uh, the victim. And any customer that happened to be there would, would go down with them. They were usually uh, the owners of small convenience stores or gas stations or liquor stores. Storekeepers were arming themselves with guns or getting dogs or locking the doors. They wouldn't let anybody in except a customer they knew. And this fear that people had mounted with each new killing, all random. You never know where they were going to strike next. It started here at this gas station on Stanley Street in New Britain. This was the first of a series of murders which occurred during the next several months in which they killed a total of seven people netted about $308, I think it was, that they, that they got out of all these robberies. But in addition to the seven that they killed, they left a wake of probably another seven or eight people who they pistol whipped and blackjacked and left for dead after firing a bullet at them. Sam Rome was assigned to the case after this particular murder. Sam was in command of the detective bureau for the state police. He was Hollywood's version, really, of a colorful cop. He wore a snap brim fedora. He always had a cigar in his mouth, unlighted, he called his pacifier. And he was very articulate, a very cunning individual, and frequently unorthodox, to the point where he became very controversial. A lot of his arrests and convictions were challenged in the courts. <laughs> 
Sam Rome suspected Joseph Taborski, who had spent four years on death row for a 1950 West Hartford murder. Taborski had been set free after a Connecticut Supreme Court decision cited the state's use of the testimony of his brother, later shown to be insane, to convict him. Rome finally broke the case when he interviewed Frank Adenolfi, the owner of a North Haven shoe store, who had survived a pistol whipping and shooting. So Sam said, what did these guys say when they came into the store? He said, they said they want to buy a pair of shoes. Did they mention a size? Guys, yeah, size 12. Sam said to me, who do you know wears size 12 shoes? I said, I know what you mean, Joe Taborski, but it couldn't be him. You know, here's a guy who just got out of death row. But on that hunch, uh, Sam got a picture in which Joe Taborski, Albert Taborski, his brother, Cologne, Arthur Cologne, and a couple of others who had robbed a dairy mart in Hartford. And he brought that picture to Adenolfi. He said, he pointed to Joe Taborski, he says, is this the fellow that shot you? He said, I don't know about him, but I know this other guy was the guy, and he pointed to Cologne. That put him onto Cologne. Arthur Cologne was an ex-convict who had been involved in several armed robberies in the Hartford area. He had an IQ of 64 and was illiterate. As soon as he was apprehended by the police, he asked for a lawyer. And the detective, Sam Robe, said, well, we don't choose who your lawyer is. Who do you want as a lawyer? And he said, and he offered him, Sam Rome offered Cologne a, a, a telephone directory, but he knew that Cologne couldn't read. So that request of Cologne for a lawyer was simply not acted on by the police. So a series of interrogations occurred, which stretched from a Saturday to the following Wednesday. He was interrogated at night and during the day. His wife came to see him at the implication of uh, Rome, and his wife begged him to tell the truth. He saw his children uh, during this time. On Tuesday, however, he cracked and said that <clears throat> he and Joe were the killers. So confronted with that, Joe still wouldn't confess. Joe had a hatred of, of, of society, but he loved his mother. And Sam brought the mother to headquarters, showed her Arthur's confession, and now confronted Taborski with his mother, who said, I've seen the evidence, Mr. Rome showed it to me. I know you did these killings. I now want you to confess. And he says, I didn't do these things, Ma. He says, I know you did. And I don't care what you've done, but you don't lie to me. And if you do, you're no longer my son. That did it. He went to pieces, started crying, threw his arms around, and said, yes, I did these things. A superior court jury convicted Cologne and Taborski primarily on their confessions. Because they were sentenced to death, there was an automatic appeal to the state Supreme Court, which upheld the convictions. Then Taborski gave up, and eventually Taborski was, was executed. He was the last person executed in Connecticut. But Cologne, uh, through a public defender, brought his case to the United States Supreme Court. And the court said, look, we will notice the fact that he's a mental defective, that his, his uh, IQ placed him in the moron category, literally. And given his limited IQ, holding him for that many days, denying him a right to see his counsel, uh, and then persistently questioning him, all of the circumstances, the court said, rendered his uh, confession involuntary. And looking at this totality of circumstances, the Supreme Court ruled that their constitutional rights had been trampled by Sam Rome. And the case was uh, sent back for a retrial. And, the, and Cologne, because the confessions now were worthless, they couldn't convict these two guys. They had no ballistics, they had no bullets, because all the bullets had been shattered going through skulls. Uh, they had the confession only. Cologne could have gone free. Instead, he elected to plead guilty to second-degree murder, chiefly because he was afraid to come out into society. The day he was brought here for the reenactment of the crime, there were probably 500 people dangling ropes and uh, hollering, let's, launch, let's lynch these guys, you know, and he was scared to death over that. And he said, I'd rather stay in prison. Shortly after Cologne, the Supreme Court I'm sure influenced in part by cases like Cologne, 
said, look, what we really ought to do is have clear rules. And one of the rules we'll have, implementing the Fifth Amendment of the Constitution, which says you can't be required to incriminate yourself. One of the rules we'll have is a rule that says every police officer in America, when they question a person, is going to have to tell them certain rights, is going to have to tell them they have a right to remain silent, that anything they say may be used against them, and that they have a right to consult with an attorney before any questioning. That's the Miranda case that came uh, many years later. It was the Cologne case that showed the court the need to have the Miranda decision. In a Farmington cemetery, there is a tombstone that marks the grave of Foon, a West African who died in 1841 while bathing in the nearby river. Foon was one of a group of 53 kidnapped West Africans who successfully broke the bonds of slavery and galvanized anti-slave forces in the years preceding the Civil War. This Amistad rebellion led to the first civil rights case in the United States. In 1838, a group of um, Africans, Mount Mende, from the area of Africa we now know as Sierra Leone. Uh, it was brought, kidnapped actually, um, into, uh, by a Portuguese, um, and put on a Portuguese ship and brought to Cuba. Uh, there, uh, 53 of them were bought by two men and put on a ship named the Amistad. They were transferred to uh, be taken to the other side of the island where they were going to be enslaved. Um, and on the way to the other side, there was a rebellion aboard the ship led by a Mende leader called Sinke. The rebellion lasted approximately a day and the ship was captured by these 53 Africans. They killed the captain and kept two of the crew alive so they could steer the ship back to Africa. During the day, the crew would sail toward Africa because Sinque reasoned that they had come this way toward the rising sun so they should sail back toward the setting sun. The two members obeyed his orders during the day, but at night they turned inland, hoping that they would be captured. And this zigzagging course um, led it for this little over a month up the coast here. They finally landed, almost waterless, foodless, emaciated, off of Montauk, which is the most northern point of Long Island. And there, the Africans got in a boat and went on shore. A US naval ship, under the command of a Captain Gedney, found these Africans and the boat, captured them, um, and took them to New Haven and jailed them. And there begins this Amistad case. The abolitionist movement at that time in the United States was in somewhat disarray. And the Amistad Africans landing here was kind of a God-sent rallying point. There was fear that uh, agitation on the slavery issue would destroy the Union. Congress refused or passed a resolution denying the right of any congressperson to debate the issue of slavery, even mention it. The significance is that the abolitionists, in order to dramatize the evils of slavery in American society, uh, used uh, the Amistad case and other issues. Students at Yale University rallied around the cause. They went, raised money. They taught the Africans how to read and write. Min missionaries came in and gave them lesson lessons in Christianity, helped to convert them. Um, there was a, they became a kind of a, a very famous group. It was kind of a, almost a circus scene from time to time because the jailer was actually charging for people to come by and take a look at these Africans. There were a lot of wild stories um, that sensational, the New York press for instance, the Herald, uh, showed all kinds of drawings of the captives, making them half, one and a half times their size. Uh, they exercised on the green, and they, and they actually did some flips and, and things. Uh, these were emphasized all out of proportion. So the media sensationalized the story. Connecticut was the staging place for all of this, and there were some unique things that Connecticut brought to it. The whole 
fact that up in the New England area here, you had the West Tappan, people very much involved in the anti-slavery movement. They formed something called the Amistad Committee. It was a very sensational case because President Van Buren, of course, was under pressure from the Spanish government, and he was under pressure from southern states and southern senators and congressmen to return the Amistad victims to, to in quote, their owners. But the facts of the case showed that these people had been illegally kidnapped. Abolitionist Lewis Tappan, who had a summer home in New Haven, funded much of the defense for the West Africans. Charges of mutiny and murder were dismissed by U.S. Circuit Court in Hartford, which noted that the revolt took place in Cuban waters. But a number of conflicting claims still needed to be addressed. The case went to federal district court in New Haven, where Roger Sherman Baldwin argued for the Mendy. Most importantly, the question as to whether the Africans were part of the ship's cargo or were they free men had to be resolved. The Spanish government sought the return of the ship, its cargo, and the Africans who would be tried as murderers. The U.S. wanted to avoid a diplomatic crisis and supported Spain. The Cuban slave traders also wanted custody. The anti-slave forces argued that since the importation of slaves from Africa had been made illegal by the Spanish, the 36 surviving Africans had been kidnapped and were therefore free. The case with dramatic testimony by Shungay and others was a sensation forcing the nation to confront the slavery issue. Presiding District Judge Andrew Judson issued a stunning ruling that the Africans had indeed been kidnapped illegally and were free to return to Africa. But the U.S. appealed to Federal Circuit Court in Hartford, which upheld the decision. The case reached the U.S. Supreme Court one year later. Perhaps the most dramatic thing about the actual trial that went on is that former President John Quincy Adams argued it before the Supreme Court. Um, Adams was quite old by this time, and um, the anti-slavery people were the ones who really um, imposed upon him um, and, and begged him, really, to argue this case. The key issue, however, turned on the claim that the Spanish had made that they owned the property. Indeed, what the court found was that the documents that the Spanish produced to prove ownership were forged. They had backdated them so that it would appear that they had not been bought in the period during which enslavement was now illegal. The court missed an opportunity to say that enslavement was immoral and illegal. The Constitution at this time left it up to the states to decide whether or not they wished to keep enslavement. Uh, if the court had said it was illegal, it was, of course, on the political balance, totally out of whack here. Instead, uh, they did rule on these narrow grounds that enslavement was illegal in Spain um, and that um, the importation of enslavement to the U.S. was illegal and that the documents were fraudulent. So they got rid of all those claims and the court said, okay, you are free, which meant, of course, you gotta get, your, get back home the best way you can. What that did, of course, was put the anti-slavery people back in, in motion again. So they brought him to Farmington, which at that time was an important abolitionist town where they stayed for six months. And the abolitionists arranged for them to travel throughout Connecticut and parts of New England. They would read the Bible. They would speak. Um, Shange would give talks. They were basically going around earning money by defeating the stereotypes. They collected enough money for their passage. They got back to Sierra Leone in 1841. Today, America continues to battle over abortion rights, but it wasn't long ago that the controversy in Connecticut was over the right to use contraceptives. Before 1965, it was illegal in Connecticut to prescribe, sell, or use any birth control devices. Contraceptives, along with obscenity and abortion, were outlawed by the Comstock Law, passed in 1879. Although the contraceptive ban was widely disregarded by doctors and condoms were available under the drugstore counter, for poor people, birth control advice was unavailable. The successful fight to overturn these laws led to widespread repercussions. So women who had enough money for private health care 
were getting help. Women who didn't have enough money for that and had to go to the clinics at the hospital were unable to get that kind of help. In 1923, New York City birth control activist Margaret Sanger inspired Mrs. Thomas Hepburn and two other Hartford women to found the Connecticut Birth Control League, later to become Planned Parenthood of Connecticut. For two sessions, I believe it was, between 23 and the time we opened the clinic, at least two or three sessions, bills were submitted to try and change the Connecticut law. They were defeated, and it was largely on a religious basis. Hepburn and her supporters continued their legislative efforts. Then in 1935, the League openly defied the Comstock law and opened nine clinics in the state to offer information, condoms, and diaphragms. A woman had to be at least 18 years of age to be married, to have at least one child, and to be recommended by a doctor, a minister, or a social agency. And then, unfortunately, in the 30s, late 30s, our Waterbury Clinic was closed. The Waterbury Clinic was closed, the police raided the clinic, there were arrests made, and at that point in time, a decision had to be made around the other clinics. So it became evident that this would probably happen all around the state to the other clinics. And our lawyers on the board advised us to close in 1940 then. That was, we had been opened almost five years. I think some wanted to continue. I know Mrs. Hepburn did. She thought it would be just great if we went to prison and so forth. But by that time, I was married and had two children, and my husband was in active practice, and we somehow weren't very anxious to find me in prison for a couple of years. So we did close the clinic. But we did proceed then to continue trying to change the law in the legislature and every two years, groups would come, and it became more and more a contest and a shouting affair. There was an intense period of lobbying, and you will find women uh, throughout the state that were part of that, that went in buses up to uh, the state legislature. Every year they were there, and every year inaction happened. So many uh, bills had been presented to the Connecticut legislature to try to repeal those Comstock laws and it was totally unsuccessful because back then as now Connecticut is primarily a Catholic state and, and we felt we had the and the Senate was overwhelmingly Catholic and it off, the bill would often get through the House but would be stopped in the Senate. And what we did was not twofold. We worked in the legislature continuing to work on the, the repeal of those statutes and we started taking women to New York. Uh, we organized caravans and buses, and basically to get a diaphragm, you're married in Connecticut, um, you know, you're basically wanting to space your children, and you have to get on a bus and go to Port Chester to New York to get a diaphragm. It felt like border running. It felt illicit somehow. Every time I came back across the border from Port Chester, I always felt as though I should look over my shoulder to see if the police were following somehow, a little like contraband coming in the state. In 1942, New Haven doctor Wilder Tylston sued the state, seeking to prescribe birth control to women at risk from pregnancy. After losing in state Supreme Court, he appealed to the U.S. Supreme Court, which dismissed the case, ruling that a doctor could not challenge the law on behalf of a patient. More failed lawsuits and legislative bills followed. Then in 1954, Essex resident Estelle Griswold joined Planned Parenthood as executive director. She was a friend of mine, delightful person. I'd gone through high school with her. She called me one day and said, what do you think about it? They've asked me if I'd like to take this job. I have a good job now in New York. And I said, Estelle, that organization is practically dead because we've gone to the legislature every other year and nothing's happened and the clinic is closed. And if you want to raise something from the dead, come aboard which she did, that was all she needed. She was that type of person, and she came and stimulated everybody. Estelle Griswold secured the help of Dr. Lee Buxton, head of the Yale Department of Gynecology and Obstetrics, in finding five patients to join in a lawsuit to overturn the Comstock law. Once again, the state Supreme Court upheld the law, and an appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court was dismissed, 
This time, as Justice Felix Frankfurter wrote, because the Comstock law had gone unenforced for so long, the court could not umpire such a meaningless debate. After that decision, we decided that a clinic should be opened, that if, in fact, there was no prosecution, then, then we would go ahead and open clinics in other communities, but the first one was going to be in New Haven. My impression back in 1961 at the time when we opened the clinic was that there was really no great push to, to uh, prosecute. Certainly no one was, was uh, actively pushing it except for an individual named James Morris who picketed the clinic. He also was very active in calling upon the governor and the and senators and you name it to arrest the, the uh, people in the clinic and to prosecute. Still nothing happened and so I went to see the prosecutor, Julie Moretz, one day to ask him uh, just what was going to happen. And he said, well, you know, he was getting pressure from here and there. Pe people wanted to uh, do something and he didn't really care, but he guessed he was going to have to do something. And I suggested to him that I would be happy to have Mrs. Griswold and Dr. Buxton come down and surrender at uh, headquarters rather than have a raid. So that's how we worked it out. Estelle and Lee went down by appointment one day and, and were arrested and the case began. On Saturday morning I received a call from Mrs. Griswold saying, you said, is there anything, if there's anything I can do, let me know. There's something you can do. And I said, what? <laughs> She said, we need you to turn state's evidence so that we can get this case into the court. I said, turn state's evidence against you? And she said, we need three patients who were at the clinic who will in fact say in court, yes, Mrs. Griswold advised me to use birth control. Yes, Dr. Buxton prescribed for me. Um, and then with that proof that we have broken the law, we can go ahead with the case in court. The state Supreme Court again upheld the constitutionality of the Comstock Law, and once more the case reached the U.S. Supreme Court. But this time, Planned Parenthood attorneys had added a fateful argument to their plea. When the case got to the Supreme Court, the court had to consider a, ex an extremely fundamental question. The question was, is there in the Constitution a right of privacy, a constitutional right of privacy, that the state simply cannot interfere with. And the court said, yes, there is. The word privacy is not mentioned in the Constitution. The concept of a right of privacy is not mentioned in the Constitution. But Justice Douglas, who wrote the opinion for that court, said that there are express rights given in the Constitution, but from those express rights, there are emanations that create penumbras around those rights. And the right of privacy is one of those penumbral rights around the First Amendment that makes the express guarantees of the First Amendment work. That was a very significant decision. Although there had been aspects of privacy protected before. This was the most important decision giving full protection to those aspects of marital privacy. And it was quite clearly the forerunner of the uh, abortion decision, which was decided uh, many years later. But that was a decision grounded on the constitutional right of privacy that had been decided in the Griswold case. The decision allowed Planned Parenthood to enter a period of significant growth, leading the state fight for abortion rights and providing health care and family planning services. Today, its clinics provide education, counseling, and medical services, including about 3,000 abortions to more than 51,000 clients each year. In 65, the decision comes. About the time the pill is coming into usage, there's much discussion around fertility, and you'd find the first national family planning money. And so with that consciousness on a national level came an acceptance that birth control is a public good. For Planned Parenthood of Connecticut, we go from one clinic to where we are now, 20 clinics. The explosion of provision of service that happened in the 70s 
was based on the Griswold versus Connecticut case. In 1937, three members of the Cantwell family were arrested for practicing their Jehovah's Witnesses religion in New Haven. It was the start of a landmark First Amendment case. One of the interesting things about Cantwell in so many cases is that when important rights are being presented to the Supreme Court, they're frequently presented by the least popular among us. It's rarely the Episcopal Church or the Catholic Church that is a litigant before the Supreme Court. Most of the religious cases have been brought, in fact, by the Jehovah Witnesses. Founded in 1879, the Jehovah's Witnesses claim four million members worldwide. They are a Christian denomination that emphasizes biblical literalism and evangelism. They believe the world is in its last days before destruction in a cataclysmic war. From their headquarters in Brooklyn, New York, they publish each year hundreds of millions of their magazines, Watchtower and Awake, and millions of Bibles and other books in 50 languages. Controversy has followed the witnesses, whose beliefs include a refusal to accept blood or to pledge allegiance to the flag. A great emphasis is placed on door-to-door -door and street corner soliciting. My wife and I are right from around the corner, the Kingdom Hall of Jehovah's Witnesses. Oh, yeah. I'm not interested at all. You're not. The Cantwell family worked full-time helping local congregations in this door-to-door -door work. We arrived in New Haven, uh, Connecticut in November 1937. Uh, we had a very uh, good response in the field, as well as some who, of course, were not interested, mm -hmm. and some who objected. At that time, in a connection with our work, we not only used the Watchtower magazine and our various books and the Bible, but we also used the phonograph, and uh, we would have recorded lectures by uh, qualified uh, speakers, and we would ask for the privilege of playing these for the people. Then we'd play them, and then we would offer them the literature that would explain more about the message that they had just heard. If you are a prudent person, you will desire all the information... The Cantwells were canvassing a neighborhood in New Haven that was primarily Catholic and offering to play a record called Enemies, which attacked organized religions, in particular Catholicism and the Pope. It was highly offensive to neighborhood residents. On Cassius Street, my brother Jesse had talked to two men on the street and played the phonograph recording for them, and uh, they had not uh, liked the message and it instructed him to go on, and so he had left, but then they had called the police, or someone on the street had called the police, and not finding my brother, they found me at the door and arrested me, my father, and then later on arrested my brother. Russell was arrested for violating a state ordinance that required licensing of door-to-door -door solicitors. His father and brother were arrested for disturbing the peace. The Cantwells were found guilty by the New Haven Court of Common Pleas. After the Connecticut Supreme Court sustained that decision, the Cantwells appealed to the U.S. Supreme Court. Yet still, they were peaceably engaging in their religion, to talking to people. This is the only way that we can convey what's in, my, what's in our mind and put it in your mind to where you can consider it. People were not captive audiences. They could tell us they didn't want to hear, so we were not enforcing anything on people. And uh, so the freedom of worship and freedom of the press and freedom of speech were all involved in this. We couldn't ask for permit from a man that could say, no, we don't like Jehovah's Witnesses, so we won't give you a permit. The Supreme Court, in a unanimous decision, dismissed the guilty verdicts. Cantwell against Connecticut was a major First Amendment case written by Justice Roberts, who essentially said that they had a right not only to believe what they wanted, but to say what they believed, as long as they were not harming people, and that government could not close them down. They didn't say there can't be any licensing. If you want to say that there can be no fraud committed in the course of door-to-door -door solicitation, clearly that's constitutional. But they said it's too great a threat to freedom of religion if you let an individual administrator decide which solicitors get to promote religions and which don't. 
the fellow who was on the street, the issue was slightly different. The court said, look, there are episodes that happen on streets which are highly offensive. And if a person threatens violence, incites violence, uh, to use the words of an earlier Supreme Court case, uses fighting words, uh, he can be punished for breach of the peace. But they said, this man didn't do any of those things. It's true this man expressed views that were offensive to those who heard his views, but the court said that's what the First Amendment's all about. There are lots of hard questions around the edges. There's some point at which the police can move in to prevent somebody from being mugged. Uh, but the basic principle that free speech means that I can say something offensive to other people that makes them very mad was really established in Cantwell and remains critically important today. Every time we stop, hey, what's that sound? Everybody look what's going down. Well, at the time, in 1969, it was a period of great ferment on campuses, indeed uh, significant unrest. We had the war in Vietnam, which was a terribly un popular event. We had the death of Martin Luther King uh, uh, that occurred back in uh, 68. Uh, certainly focused the country's attention on the problems of race. And students wanted uh, direct involvement in the administration of higher education. You had uh, takeovers at Columbia. You had the free speech movement at Berkeley. You had all of these things spreading through a lot of campuses. Uh, students were demanding, and that was the rhetoric of the day, demanding involvement and participation and decision making. Central. Uh, came a little bit late in some of the uh, events of real heavy-duty unrest. This was no hotbed of, of uh, revolution or anything else, but there were a lot of students who sincerely felt that things that were going on nationally and locally were wrong, and they wanted to have their say about it and did. The world was so sedate in 1966. We came to campus as freshmen. We had hazing. Steve and I were talking earlier, we had to wear beanies for Beanie uh, Week, uh, Freshman Harassment Week, whatever you wanted to call it. And the complexion changed so tremendously in four years. Central Connecticut was established in 1849 as a teacher school. It was primarily a commuter school, with many students the first in their families to attend college. Conservatism and career preparation had characterized most of the student body. It seemed as though we were uh, 20 years behind the scene. It, it was very, very sedate, very, very quiet. I think things began to change in 69, and finally what was happening uh, across the country nationally caught up, up with us here. Many of us saw the Vietnam War as, uh, as really a rallying point for a larger revolution that we were all a part of. And so all over the country, administrators were being told that you have to prepare for a building takeover. I can remember Back in those days, uh, we were uh, asked to join a meeting uh, in secret, almost, of university officials from New England in, a, in Massachusetts to be briefed by the uh, FBI, the CIA, and uh, God knows who else telling this is what you must plan for. And that was scary in a lot of ways. I don't remember any violence on campus, but the only thing that was approach violence was the takeover administration building by uh, the uh, Central 29. That's the, right. The That's black right. students. That's right. Mm -hmm. One night they had barricaded themselves in there and basically said that they would not leave until uh, the demands that they had were met. Many of us who were active on campus, whether we were white or black, had a kind of mini rally outside um, the administration building. I remember being one of a number of people that were laid across the, uh, the entrance to the building that the police were prepared to storm. Police. Meanwhile, he had put a big show of rushing from the front, and they had slipped a few people in from the back and actually had uh, slipped into the building and, and uh, occupied the back of the building. It kind of worked out to be a compromise. They felt the institution's practices and were racist. Uh, the students were very angry. Now, that led to a series of confrontations uh, that lasted, in fact, for the whole year of 1969. The student newspaper changed drastically. The way that the students uh, operated changed drastically in many of these things. The one thing that brought the campus together was student rights. In 1969, a group of CCSC students who were affiliated with the national group Students for a Democratic Society would test the limits of student rights at Central. SDS had sponsored anti-war and racism demonstrations on hundreds of campuses since the early 60s. But by the late 60s, the group had splintered, 
and an extremist faction called the Weathermen began a series of violent confrontations. SDS at Central had never been violent, but they would not totally disassociate themselves from the national SDS. All, in fact, they were looking for was a place to meet on campus. Not even to have rallies or anything, just a place, a, a room, a place to come sit. They wanted to uh, create a forum, and so they wanted official recognition to be able to reserve rooms to do that. So it was at that time that, uh, that they had to apply to, to actually charter themselves as a campus organization. We received the petition in the Student Affairs Committee. There was a long deliberation, and the Student Affairs Committee uh, voted in a 6-2 to two vote to recognize them. I went to the president's cabinet, and at the cabinet we had a very thorough discussion, and we decided that we would not allow the SDS on campus because we didn't feel that its objectives or its philosophy or its direction was in the best interest of the students on this campus. The uh, president, who has the ultimate authority by law to make the decision, uh, voted to uh, uh, reject the uh, recommendation of the Student Affairs Committee and denied uh, recognition. Dr. James was a very stubborn guy, and uh, once that decision was made, um, as the expression goes, hell or high water would have moved him uh, to change it. He felt he got the facts, he listened to his cabinet, he listened to me, and he decided that was the road he wanted to take, and uh, he stayed there. Uh, thereupon, the students posted a notice that they would meet to challenge the administration's decision. As the dean then, I had to carry out administrative policy. I went to the students one night in the Devil's Den, presented them with an order, said, you, you cannot meet as SDS. Uh, you are not recognized to do so. And the students said, OK, and disbanded. And there was no hostility uh, that uh, set the uh, steps in motion for the federal court suit, which resulted in the students' petition uh, that they, their due process had been violated. Uh, and they requested a TRO a temporary restraining order was granted, and in granting that temporary restraining order, Judge Clary ruled that the decision that the president made had been done without uh, the president giving the students an opportunity to be heard by him as the decision maker. Uh, so he ordered a hearing. Indeed, a hearing was held. It sometimes was acrimonious. I conducted the hearing. And finally, based on that hearing, President James denied uh, a charter to the group. Following that, Judge Clary uh, accepted the president's ruling, confirmed it, and said that the decision was made appropriately and that there had been no violation of First Amendment rights. And then from that point, uh, the matter went to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit in New York, uh, which supported Judge Clary's rule in a two-to-one decision. Ultimately, uh, it moved uh, from there uh, to the U.S. Supreme Court. They said that uh, the authorities at uh, Central Connecticut had uh, totally mishandled the, the whole affair in a constitutional way. Uh, guilt by association and uh, failure to give appropriate hearing and uh, that SDS was entitled uh, to be heard. The issue that the Supreme Court focused on was that the lower courts had erred in their judgment by placing the burden on the students to prove that they were this or that rather than the university. It said that uh, the record was somewhat unclear on several, several points. It remanded it back to Judge Clary. To clear those issues up, Judge Clary uh, uh, remanded it to us. And uh, one of the issues uh, at the time was, uh, would the students agree to be bound by uh, reasonable rules and regulations of the university? And if so, uh, then the university had a uh, responsibility to grant the charter. That issue was never uh, <laughs> fulfilled because by the time the decision <clears throat> came out, the students had gone. And even though we communicated to the students that we could find, uh, the issue was moot. Well, it was very significant because it, uh, it held very clearly that in the same kind of problem used to come up with the Communist Party where people were, uh, in the 50s and 60s, when people were condemned as for associating with the Communist Party on the general notion that the Communist Party also liked to engage in disruptive behavior and indeed, worse, wanted to overthrow the United States government by force and violence and uh, made it clear that uh, no matter who the, who the demon is of the particular uh, uh, historical era, that the same uh, detached principles, important principles about freedom of association, and freedom of speech, and rights on campus and academic freedom applied in whatever the historical context was.
To what extent can the federal government limit our travel abroad? In 1962, a successful businessman and political activist sued the State Department to remove a passport inscription that banned travel to Cuba. It was another notable chapter in the life of Louis Zemmel. Much constitutional law is developed by getting people who are courageous and sufficiently, uh, sometimes <laughs> eccentric, uh, in persisting to, uh, in, in advocating and fighting for uh, constitutional rights and fighting for freedoms, uh, and Zemmel was one of them. Former radio repairman Louis Zemmel and his brother Herman opened a radio store in New Haven in 1932. By 1959, Zemmel Brothers had grown into a three-store chain of appliance outlets. After 27 years in business, uh, my brother and I decided that sailing was more fun than working and we made a very satisfactory arrangement with our employees. We put them in business and they put us out of business. What created this drive in your brother? When he went to Europe and saw the, the horrors of the war, of what a madman could accomplish, he, uh, he came back a different man. He was misinterpreted by a a lot of people. An idealist would be the term I would give them. It wasn't long before the Zemmels were back in business, this time creating a successful ski resort in the Middlefield, Connecticut Hills. He was uh, obviously a successful businessman. Uh, built this Powder Ridge um, area out of virtually nothing. And at the same time, he was uh, a believer in the uh, more of an equal distribution of, of rights. You know, I think if you uh, take, you know, your average businessman, they wouldn't have as, as radical views as he did. People thought he was a communist. As a matter of fact, I have a big stack of papers like this from the government that they spent a lot of money following him around, watching him, to come to the conclusion in the end that he was an idealist and a visionary, but he wasn't a communist. There was nobody that <clears throat> had a better understanding of how the capitalistic system worked than Louis Zemo. I never fully understood how Louis could uh, operate quite as he did within the capitalistic system and still, both by word and by action, do things that seemed to be in opposition or designed to uh, um, work against the capitalistic system. Most of the townspeople were opposed to him. We weren't very tolerant at that time, and we had there was rumors that he was a communist and that he was this and that and other things, and he read, ran, ran benefits for core insane, and a lot of people resented it. He was opposed to the Vietnam War when we all should have been opposed to it, you know, and uh, a lot of other things. He was, he was terrific with, with minorities or anybody disadvantaged. Now, I think if he were here today, he would be embraced by 98% of the population. But at that time, he was very controversial. And he was the kind of a guy that enjoyed a challenge. You know, if you told him he couldn't do something, that really inspired him to just go on and hard to try harder to do it. And he had a lot of courage. Sometimes he faced crowds that I wouldn't dare face, you know. And he'd get up there and say, hey, I've come to build bridges, not destroy them. I remember one day that always struck me interesting. He was shaving, phone rang. And it was a person from the Ku Klux Klan calling him to argue with him what, over what he had said on television about um, running for the Senate and, and whatever he had to say about racism and so forth. And now, instead of just hanging up on this Ku Klux, this was so typically Lou, he sat there. I took his picture. He's now talking for half an hour to this Ku Klux Klan person and trying to explain to him how he, wrong he is. <laughs> World peace was important to him. That was his main thrust. He traveled everywhere. He went to peace conferences around the world. He wanted to travel to Cuba, and he also wanted to prove a point. In the early 60s, hostility between communist Cuba and the U.S. was marked by the ill-fated Bay of Pigs invasion by CIA operatives, and then by the discovery and forced dismantling of Soviet missiles in Cuba. The U.S. banned travel to Cuba in 1961, but Zemmel wanted to see conditions firsthand and in 1962, he sued the State Department. 
it had been well established that there was a constitutional right to travel interstate. Uh, and many people felt that there was also a right to travel abroad. But what Zemmel felt was that the State Department and the Secretary of State, in this case Dean Rusk under President John Kennedy, uh, was acting in a way that had not been authorized by Congress. He felt that uh, the laws that gave some authority to the State Department did not include the right to limit uh, the ability of Americans to travel wherever they wanted. The Supreme Court said no, they have the power to do that, and that it's constitutional. The court was careful, however, not to reach the further question whether you could actually punish Mr. Zemmel if he, in fact, went to Cuba. They said that question is not before us, and so they didn't decide that. Shortly after um, the Zemmel case, a group of students in the mid-60s decided that they were going to go to Cuba anyhow, passport or not, and they went to Cuba and they were indicted for traveling without a passport. And they appealed to the United States Supreme Court where they won, where the court said that uh, you didn't need a passport to travel. And uh, it's very inconvenient to travel without a passport, but nevertheless, it's not criminal. Then the Treasury Department regulations were tightened up, making it illegal to spend money in Cuba. The situation today is that generally speaking, one can travel to Cuba or, for that matter, anywhere else uh, without a passport. So that the battle that uh, Zemmel fought, he lost uh, at the time, but historically it was won uh, as a result of uh, changing the court. Every time a new member comes on, uh, the whole disposition of many kinds of cases changes. That's the way our constitutional law is made in these areas by a series of of attacks, some of which are won, some of which is law, are lost. In 1980, Zemmel was a U.S. Senate candidate for the Citizens Party, receiving less than 1% of the vote. He died at the age of 70 in 1981. Summer is over, vacation is over, the fall has started, you either want this ministry and are called to it or you don't, and after 15 years, I am ready to leave. In 1980, religious broadcaster Dr. Gene Scott's Faith Center was charged with deceptive fundraising by the Federal Communications Commission. The FCC, which allocates broadcast licenses, had revoked Scott's three California licenses. Now they had started forfeiture proceedings for the group's WHCTV Channel 18 in Hartford. Faith Center opted to sell the station under the FCC's distress sale policy which allows broadcasters in forfeiture hearings to sell without competitive bidding to an approved minority group. This affirmative action program is designed to increase the present 3.5% minority ownership of the nation's 11,000 broadcast licenses. It's important for minorities to be understood by non-minorities. It's important for minorities to understand their own culture. It's, it's part of our democratic system for cultures to express themselves in diverse viewpoints. And that is what uh, this minority ownership policy seeks to achieve. It's the diversity of viewpoint that is at the core of this issue. Faith Center sold WHCT in 1985 for $3.1 million to Astroline Communications, a partnership headed by Hispanic American Richard Ramirez. We set out with, with hopes and expectations that um, people in the future would look at Channel 18 as a place where quality broadcasters of minority backgrounds got introduced to the business, learned some good basics, uh, and then would progress on in their careers. And in fact, a number of them did. Computer consultant Alan Sherberg challenged the policy, claiming reverse discrimination. If one accepts the premise that a particular minority or minorities in, as an aggregate have a particular viewpoint and certainly minority ownership viewed as a separate component is a good thing. But in order to do that, you're actually engaging in racism. We felt that uh, in order to, uh, to be a successful broadcaster, we had to be in general market um, mainstream uh, programming. And yet we uh, were responding to that in unique ways, tempered by our experiences uh, and our perceptions of, uh, of what was important and valuable to the community. After a federal appeals court invalidated the FCC policy, Astroline appealed to the nation's highest court, which heard the case and a similar dispute in Florida in the spring of 1990. The court ruled that the Federal Communications Commission 
uh, primary task of diversity, which runs directly from, its, from the First Amendment, um, was a, such a compelling interest of the nation that the Commission had some latitude in imposing uh, benign burdens upon non-minorities in order to increase that diversity. The court further stated, following from that diversity argument, that race and ethnic origin um, were issues of diversity because they would, they would contribute to the composition of the individual and the attitude of the individual and their judgment of editorial content. The court ruled that uh, what was minority program or not minority programming or minority programming content was not the issue, that the government could not get into content regulation, should not get into content regulation, and therefore had to find plausible proxies for those issues. The court also affirmed um, the ability of Congress to enact uh, affirmative action in civil rights legislation that does in fact have uh, some um, impact on non-minorities uh, in order to uh, achieve a compelling governmental interest. As the case made its way through the courts, Channel 18 entered Chapter 11 bankruptcy. Its broadcast time is today filled by paid commercial programs, religious shows, syndicated reruns, movies, and sports. Its future under Astroline remains unclear, but this time due to economic conditions. We were granted an opportunity to lose, to lose $30 million here. That's, that's about as much as we got. Um, there, there's no um, built-in uh, ongoing benefit to how we come about the license. We're forced to compete on an economic environment uh, just like any other television station. How did you feel when the decision was announced? Uh, I was, uh, I was uh, frankly, quite surprised. I was uh, uh, absolutely... Um, Screaming. <laughs> Everybody says, you know, I'm going to take this case to the Supreme Court, and yours ended up there. You know, what were your feelings when, when you were there? The circumstance, the, the ritual of it is absolutely uh, uh, an exhilarating uh, experience. I mean, in the building itself, and the chamber, and the awe in which the whole proceeding takes place, not just myself, but everybody that I, I witnessed there, professionals who'd argued before the bench numerous times, um, all of that is, is captivating, it's, it's uplifting. In its interpretation of federal statutes, and interpreting the Bill of Rights, and in interpreting the Constitution, the Supreme Court ultimately makes policy in this country just as much as Congress does, just as much as the President does, and perhaps more fundamentally. The Bill of Rights and the Constitution create a generally healthy environment in society where people feel that we really do live in a free country. I think the feeling that there's something that we can look to uh, as a shield between authoritarian or oppressive government and our well-being I think is one of the hallmarks of a, of a democratic society. What's essential for people actually to have civil rights rather than simply have the opportunity of a lawsuit when they're violated is people who care about them. Constitutional provisions and the Supreme Court and lower courts can help, but really what matters is what we all do every day. Funding for this program was made possible by United States Constitution Bicentennial Commission of Connecticut.